All right, we are looking at chapter 14, practice problems. And the first one says, how is the rate of disappearance of ozone related to the appearance of oxygen in the following equation? So we have two O3, and as that is disappearing, we are um, having three moles of O2 appearing. So to show this, if we were to break down, so we're looking at the change in concentration over the change in time. And if we look at concentration, concentration is molarity, and molarity is equal to moles per liter. Okay, so let's look at if we have oxygen. So if I have the concentration of ozone and I have a change in it. So I'm, I have a final and an initial value of that concentration over a certain amount of time. Now that concentration again is moles per liter. So I'm going to look at this mole ratio here and I'm going to say, well, I'm losing. So that signifies this is a reactant, so it's going to lose. So I will have a disappearance of that and I will lose two moles of that. Remember, if I were to get rid of this concentration bracket and say that this is moles per liter, if I broke that down, I have two moles of O3 for, let's say this whole reaction is one mole of the reaction. So two moles of ozone I'm losing for every one mole of reaction. So this can be simplified, and we can then just say that I'm losing the change in concentration of O3 for a certain delta T, and I'm going to actually make this before this. I'm going to say negative one half. Right, that ratio, that one mole of reaction, I'm going to be losing two mo moles of O3 in a certain amount of time. That's my disappearance. Disappearance is always negative. Now, the appearance of oxygen, I can say, so if I look at O2, now this guy, I have a 3 to 1 ratio. I'm having three moles of oxygen appear for every one mole of reaction. So I would show that as, that's a positive value because it's appearing. And if I looked at my O2, the concentration again is moles per liter. And then I'm still going to have that change in time on the bottom here. And we have three moles of O2 for every one mole reaction. So again, I can simplify this and I can just put this one third in front of the change in concentration of O2 in a certain amount of time. So because I know that both of these for, are for one mole of the reaction, I can set them equal to one another. And then I can just say my disappearance of Ozone is equal to the appearance of oxygen. Looking at number two, we want to know the relative rates for the following. So I had to first balance this reaction. I looked at the right side and said that there's four P's, so I need four P's on the left. And that gave me 12 H's, so I needed 12 H's on the right. Knowing those coefficients, I can then look at those relative rates for the disappearance of pH3 and the appearance of the products. And again, just like the first one, I can say that for every one mole of reaction, the disappearance of pH 3, it loses four moles for every one mole of reaction. And at the same time, P4, that's a one to one ratio for every one mole of reaction. There's a coefficient of one, so the one would be in the bottom, so one to one. So we can just say that the change in concentration of P4 over the change of concentration of time, and it's set equal to 
we can say one mole of reaction, then the six would be on the bottom. Um, the change in concentration of H2 over the change in concentration of time. And again, these are appearances, so they're positive, and this is the disappearance, so it's negative. Let's look at number three. We're given a reaction here, and it says that it's experimentally found to be first order in H2, third order in NO. So first order for H2, third order for NO. So to write the rate law, we always write rate is equal to K, and then in brackets we would have H2 to the first order and NO to the third order. So the overall order, we just add up the exponents, the orders. 1 plus 3 is a um, overall order of 4. And to find the units for the rate constant is just as easy as looking at the units for everything else. So rate is always molarities per second, right? The change in concentration over the change in time. So molarity per second. Molarity per second. Then, obviously, K, we need to find the units for K. H, the concentration to the first order is just M, so concentration is molarity. And then we have molarity cubed, so molarity cubed. So if I have molarity cubed times molarity one, that would be molarity to the fourth. So I need to do molarity per second divided by, divided by M to the fourth. So we're going to go m to the fourth down here, m to the four and m, so this will cancel, and then this will take this down to three, so my units must be, k is, we can say one over seconds m cubed, or we can say k is equal to m inver inverse of m to the third, and S, like that. All right, let's look at number four. If the concentration, see, so we're looking at this rate law here. If M is equal to one, so if I have the concentration of something to the first order, so if I have the concentration of something to the first order, the concentration of A, so let's say that the concentration of A doubles. Well, let's say the concentration was one, and now the concentration doubles, so it goes up to two. So one raised to the first power is one. Two raised to the first power is two. So what happens to the rate if it's doubled? Well, if the concentration doubles, the rate is doubled. So the rate goes up by a factor of two. What if it's to the second order. So I'm going to use some hypothetical numbers here. Let's say that doubling A fits to the second power. So let's use the same numbers here. Let's say I had a concentration of 1, and then I doubled my concentration to 2. So concentration just doubled. Let's see what happens to the rate. 1 squared, 2 squared. So my rate increased by a factor of 4. And you, this would work for any numbers. If you wanted to say use 2 here and 4 instead, 2 squared would be 4, and 4 squared would be 16. So we can see that going from 4 to 16 is increased by a factor of 4. If, we, if m is equal to 0, so if the exponent here, if the rate is to the 0 order, and I double it, then our rate is going to stay the same, right? Because anything to the zero order, anything to the zero order is going to be one, right? And if I doubled it, let's say so two to the zero order versus four to the zero order, they will it, that rate stays the same. Then if we are looking at this rate law, we can see that this is to the second order, this is to the third order. So to find the Overall, we add them up. 3 plus 2, order of 5 overall. But A is to the second order and B is to the third order. All right, moving on to number 5. 
So here we have an equation here telling us that iodide is oxidized, and we have four different experiments that we have measured the concentration of um, the reactants. We know the initial concentration of the reactants, and we've measured the rate. So with this, we need to obtain the reaction orders. Now in order to do this, we need to find two experiments where two of the three maintain a constant rate. So I'm going to look at this, just kind of looking around, I'm going to go, hey, in experiment one and two, iodine stays the same, and the concentration of H stays the same, and we varied the concentration of H2O2. So because this is where I varied H2O2, I can find the order of H2O2 by taking experiment two, uh, concentration divided by con by the first one so I can see that I doubled the concentration what happened to the rate when I doubled the concentration well, again I'm just going to do t the rate of 2 divided by the rate of 1 and I see that when I do that I get 2 so if I double the concentration and my rate doubled that means that it's to the first order okay so now we need to find to, to find um, the order for iodine, we need to find experiments where the concentration of H2O2 stayed the same and the concentration of H plus stayed the same. So I looked at three and one. Notice that H2O2 concentration is 0.01 the same and that the concentration between one and three for H plus is the same. Now, what happened to iodine? Well, if I did 3 divided by 1, so 0.02 divided by 0.01, we can see that the concentration doubled. And again, I'm going to do the rate for 3 divided by the rate of 1, and that rate doubled. So if, they, if I double the concentration and the rate doubles, again, that's to the first order. Now let's look for H+. plus. We need experiments to compare where H2O2 and, H and iodine stay the same. And so here I chose 4 and 1. Notice 0.01 and 0.01, 0.01, 0.01, those stayed the same, but it changed for H+. Plus. So let's figure out how it changed for H+. Plus. I'm going to do experiment 4 divided by experiment 1 for concentration, and I got 2. So we doubled the concentration. And when I did the rates, div 4 divided by 1, I got 1. So I doubled the concentration, but the rate stayed the same. Notice they're the same. So that means it's to the zero order. So when I write out my rate law, I'm going to say rate is equal to K times H2O to the first, iodide to the one, and my H plus to the zero order. Okay, so that's our reaction orders. Um, that's our rate law. And now we want to find the rate constant. So to do this, we just need to plug in. You can choose any experiment values you want to. One, two, three, or four. I usually choose one just because it's listed first. So I'm going to plug in for the rate. The rate that's given to me for the first reaction is equal to K. That's what I'm solving for. And then I'm going to put in the concentration of H2O2, so the 0.01. The concentration for I minus, which is 0.01, and the concentration for H plus, 0 0.0005. And I'm going to raise that to the 1, to the 1, and to the 0. And then I'm going to divide both sides by what my K is attached to. And I found that K is 0 0.0115. And that's liters per moles seconds. Again, you would have gotten the same K if you used experiment two, three, or four values plugged into that rate law. All right, let's look at question number six. We're given this reaction, and we're given five different experiments with initial concentrations and the rates. So to find the rate law, let's separate and find out where two stay the same and so just looking at this I'm gonna go okay well from one to two the concentration of NO stayed the same so what happened to the concentration of O2 so I'm just gonna do experiment two minus experiment one 
and actually, hold on, that's down here, for oxygen is 0.02 divided by 0.01. So oxygen's rate uh, concentration doubled. And then when it's concentration doubled, I did two divided by one. So 0 0.057 divided by 0 0.028, its rate doubled. So that must mean that oxygen is to the first order. And then looking at NO, finding where oxygen stayed the same. I saw that from second to fourth, it stayed the same. So I'm gonna look at what happened from second to fourth trial here. So 0.04 divided by 0.02. So when my concentration doubled, again, I took my rates and I divided those, the rate went up by four. So that must be two raised to the second power gave me four. So that must be to the second order. So the rate law would be rate is equal to K times NO to the second order and oxygen to the first order. And then the value of K constant with units, I'm just gonna use, again, I like to use experiment one just cause it's listed first. So I'm gonna put my rate the 0 0.028 is equal to K times, and then I'll plug in my uh, concentration for NO squared times the concentration of oxygen to the first power and that should give me 7,000 and then my units would be inverse uh, moles or moles inverse squared liters squared seconds inverse all right moving on to number seven here's another reaction again more experimental data so we want to determine the rate law and the rate constant so I looked at NO first. So I saw that, let's see, NO, I, so I needed to find where H2 stayed the same, so it's out of the equation. So trial one and two stayed the same. So what happened between trial one and two? I'm gonna do two divided by one. So when my concentration doubled, my rate, I'm gonna do two divided by one, went up by eight. So I can look at this and go two raised to the what power is eight? And two raised to the third power is eight. So that must be to the third order. And then for H, that means I need to find two trials where N O stayed the same. So that would be first and third. So I'm gonna use trial one and three for H. So third divided by the first. So concentration doubled. So I'm gonna do the rate, the third rate divided by the first rate. It also doubled. So two raised to the what power is two? Well, that would be to the first power. So NO is to the third, H2 is to the first power. And so then I'm just going to use, again, I like to use trial one. You would get the same if you use two or three. I'm gonna plug in the rate is equal to K times, I'm gonna cube the concentration of NO times H2 raised to the power of one. And that should give me 600,000 and units would be m negative three s negative one all right let's look at question number eight and so we're told that a student analyzed a first order reaction and obtained a graph below so i'm going to look at this cheat sheet here and remember for first order if, it, if it's a first order reaction, then my natural log of the concentration of A is on the y-axis and time is on the y-axis. So I'm just gonna label those axes, natural log of A and time. First order reaction, we know, using this integrated rate law, y equals mx plus b set up here is the natural log of the concentration of A after time t is equal to negative kt plus the natural log of the uh, concentration of A, the original concentration, so we can plug it in in this format. And so that, that would be our equation. The natural log of A is equal to negative KT plus the natural log of A. That's our Y equals MX plus B setup. Giving us Y, or this part, is the natural log of A. And this part is time.
five is on the x-axis and the mx is time. The x variable is time. y is natural log of a. Alright, moving on to number nine. At 500 degrees Celsius, cyclopropane, which is C3H6, rearranges to propene. The reaction is first order, so have that kinetics formula is first order handy. The rate constant, so it's given to us, we know K. If the initial concentration, we're given initial concentration. What is the concentration after 30 minutes? So we want to know the concentration of A after time T. And let's get, since our constant is in seconds, let's get 30 minutes into seconds. So 30 minutes times 60 seconds is 1,800 seconds. So let's set it up that y equals mx plus b. So here's our y. Remember, after time t, this is our unknown variable. The natural log of a after time t is equal to, in the last question, I just had this over here, but negative kt plus the natural log of the concentration original time or initial time. doesn't matter that it's on the left or the right. So let's plug in what we know. We know our original concentration, so the natural log of 0.05 minus, we're given our K, and we know our T time is 1800 seconds. Now, again, remember, we could have had negative 6.7 times 10 to the negative 4 times 1800 plus the natural log of 0.05. Doesn't matter that it's there or on the right. Okay, so let's simplify the right-hand side of the equation. And I got negative 4.202 is equal to the natural log of C3H6. And now we need to get rid of the natural log. And the opposite of natural log, log is using Euler's number. So E raised to the negative 4.202 should give me 0 0.015 molar as my concentration after time, after 1800 seconds. Moving on to the next question, number 10. We're told the hydrogen peroxide decomposes and is a first order reaction. The reaction has a half-life of eight hours. So I'm gonna look at, at our little cheat sheet here, our first order reaction half-life equation. So the half-life is equal to 0.693 over K. So the half-life is 0.693 over K because it's a first order reaction. We want to know the rate constant, so I just rearranged to solve for k. So k is equal to 0.693 over the half-life. And we were given the half-life of eight hours. But because um, we want, well, we could do it in hours. We could leave it at that eight hours. Um, and so I found that it was 0 0.0866 inverse hours. Or if you wanted to put it into seconds just because we put the one up above it in seconds, it doesn't matter we would get 2.41 times 10 to the negative fifth inverse seconds. All right, let's look at question 11. The decomposition, well, we've got a lot going on in this one. Here's something that I like to do, a little tip. I like to skim to actually see what are we looking for? And so I'm gonna skim, skim, skim. What is the activation energy for this reaction? Okay, so right there is what we're looking for. So what equation has activation energy? And we're going to look right here where we see activation energy and we're going to take the natural log of the K2 over K1 constants is equal to activation energy over the gas law constant R and then in parentheses 1 over T temperature 1 minus 1 over temperature 2 make sure that those temperatures are in kelvins. That activation energy was key because it wants activation energy and Arrhenius law has that. So it doesn't matter who you give the T1 and the T2 to, whether it's the 0 degrees or the 20 degrees, as long as you just make sure that that 5.6 times 10 to the negative 6 constant is with the 0 degrees. So I gave that the K2 and the T2. And the 1.6 times 10 to the negative fourth and the 20 degrees, I made T1 and K1. So then we just gotta make sure that we put everything where it needs to go. So the natural log of K2 over K1, I got negative 3.35. And that's equal to my T1 minus T2. 
and that gave me negative 2.4977 times 10 to the negative fourth times, we don't know the activation energy, but we do know that gas law constant is 8.314. So rearrange to solve for activation energy, and then I just converted, since this is a really large joule, uh, joule amount, I converted from joules to kilojoules. Either one is fine, just make sure that you end up with two significant figures, since I have two significant figures and uh, that I started with. All right, looking at number 12. A reaction that is second order, and we want to know time. How long will it take? So I'm going to look at second order here. Second order. We're going to be using the integrated rate law. 1 over a, uh, the concentration of A after a certain amount of time is equal to, in this mx plus b format, again, remember, if this side has plus 1 over the original concentration, I can just subtract that from both sides. So 1 over the concentration of A after time T minus 1 over the concentration of the original, which is what I have here, is equal to KT. And so it tells me that my rate constant is 2 times 10 to the negative 2, so I plug that in for K. The initial concentration, so this guy, initial concentration, is 0 0.320. And it tells me that it then, after a certain amount of time, goes to a concentration of 0 0.160. So that's my concentration after time t. Now I just need to solve for time, and we should get 156 seconds. Check your math, though. All right, let's look at 13. We're going to draw a potential energy diagram for an uncatalyzed exothermic reaction. So uncatalyzed means that if here's my reactants and it's exothermic products have to be down here because it's giving off energy now here's my reactants uncatalyzed means it's going to take a lot of activation energy to get up here in order for that reaction to follow through and to get to my products now let's say that I add a catalyst catalyst so if here's my reactants it only takes that much activation energy to get there. So a catalyst actually changes the path of a reaction along a new path in such a way that the activation energy decreases. And because of this, the Arrhenius, right? Here we go, whoops. Um, because of this, K increases and rate also increases. So notice that I'm not actually jumping back onto this path of my uncatalyzed. I'm forming a new path. I'm still getting to the same end result. It's just less activation energy, and so it's got a new path. Its rate is also increasing. For number 14, it says from a plot of the natural logarithm, logarithm of the rate constant. So that means ln of k, so that's our y, versus the reciprocal of the absolute temperature. So that would be my x. What can we determine? Well, remember if we look at our cheat sheet here, the natural log of k versus 1 over the absolute temperature, we can find the activation energy. So the energy of activation. Describe this equation in the form of y equals mx plus b. Well, this is my y, so I would say the natural log of k, so that's my y, is equal to mx plus b. So my m is my slope. And remember right here, my slope is the negative activation energy over r. my m, my x, we said was 1 over t, temperature, plus b, which has got to be my natural log of the concentration a. That would be my y equals mx plus b form.